The Essential Reader's Companion reveals that the threat of Abeloth was planned from the very beginning of the Fate of the Jedi series, but her exact origins were kept undefined. Abeloth was meant to be a chaotic dark side entity who was imprisoned on her world by the Celestials sometime in the distant past. But in planning the reveal about her origins for the final book in the series, Apocalypse, Lucas Licensing reached out to Troy Denning about incorporating something that had happened in the third season of The Clone Wars 3D animated series in January and February of 2011. Those three episodes revealed the existence of a world called Mortis that had three powerful force users there, and so Abeloth's origins were wrapped into that Mortis plotline. Fate of the Jedi Apocalypse by Troy Denning made it to number two on the New York Times bestseller list for the week of April 1st, 2012 and was ultimately on the list for three weeks. All I knew going into Apocalypse was somehow this book was going to have to wrap up the Sith plotline as well as Abelos plotline, and going into book number nine, I wasn't quite sure how either of those were going to play out. So a brief summary. As the Fate of the Jedi series comes to its conclusion, Jedi and Sith face off with Coruscant as the battlefield. So after letting the Sith take over Coruscant in the previous book, which I thought was an interesting move, Luke and the Jedi swoop back in an apocalypse to take the Galactic Alliance capital back. There's a little detour in the beginning where they rescue all the Jedi younglings and trainees and such from Ossus, but most of the book is focused on Coruscant and this fight to take out all the Sith infiltrators and regain the Jedi Temple and hopefully eliminate Abeloth once and for all in the process. This proves to be much harder than originally imagined, and a lot of the book is this unending attack on the Jedi Temple. Uh, but we got some other stuff going on too. Jag is still facing off against Dala. They end up coming to a ceasefire by having a general election for leader of the Imperial Remnant. And Tahiri Vela serves for some time as Jag's unofficial Imperial hand, sort of reviving that old position. Jedi are dispatched to a very long lasting Killick hive to learn some information about Abeloth. And of course, Abeloth doesn't stay on Coruscant the whole time, and so there ends up being this final showdown on her planet between Abeloth and Luke and an unknown Sith, and also Abeloth and Vestara and Ben. And Ben and Vestara's relationship sort of spectacularly blows up in the process. So let's talk about the political stuff first, as little as there is in this very combat-heavy novel. At the end of the previous book, Ascension, Wynne Dorvin was taken captive by Rokari Kem, aka Abeloth, and her Sith goons. And in Apocalypse, we find out that they've been torturing him to try to get essential information about the Galactic Alliance, and Wynne really is holding out pretty good here. I mean, his mental state is not great, but the amount of knowledge that he has leaked is surprisingly slim. He's also the first person to witness one of Abeloth's seemingly new skills here, which is her ability to take over people and almost like split her persona between different bodies. He kills the Abeloth in Rokari Kem's body and she basically goads him into it because as they realize, when Abloth possesses non-force sensitive bodies, they fall apart faster. And so she wanted to get out of Rokari Chem and get into something else. In this case, the computer core of the Jedi Temple, which I guess is a skill she picked up from Callista along the way, and definitely makes their assault on the Jedi Temple much more difficult. 
Wynn, fortunately, is rescued by the Jedi. Presumably he got a fair bit of therapy along the way, and as the book ends, he's going to be chief of state of the Galactic Alliance. Wynn Dorvin always struck me as a boring individual, but he's very competent, and I think I'm happy with him as the leader going forwards. He's seen some real bad stuff. He's lived through it, he's able to negotiate and work with different groups, so he's still boring, but he's a good choice in the end. Over on the Imperial front, Abeloth and the body of Lieutenant Pagorsky, the Imperial officer who perjured herself at Tahiri's trial, shows up to Dala offering to support her, and Dala's like, sure, great. Tahiri senses, though, that Pogorski is not what she seems, and so Jag dispatches her to a moon belonging to the Moth of the Anti-Meridian Sector, I think, to take her out, basically. Jag appoints her as an Imperial Hand, which that's what Mara was, that's what a lot of other individuals were. They have a very murky past, but it's sort of cool to see the name pop up again. And when Tahiri lands there, she runs into Boba Fett who's willing to work with her to achieve their ends. He wants the scientists who made the nanobots, who basically meant he could never return to Mandalore. Tahiri wants to take out Abelos' other body. They work together, but again, Pogorski's body was falling apart and Abelos wanted Tahiri as a new host. Glad she was able to handle that. And this leaks to the press that Jag basically bombarded another Imperial world, and that's just what Jag needs to get out of the race for head of state. He wasn't happy doing the job anyway, and instead elects Admiral Reege instead, who probably will do a much better job than Dala ever would have done. There was a throwaway line where someone, maybe it was Tahiri, was like, Jag, you didn't want to be Emperor? And he was like, oh gosh, no. I'm pretty sure that it was confirmed in the Legacy comics that Jag did become the first emperor of, like, this new empire, so maybe eventually we would have seen that play out, but poor dude, at least he doesn't have that horrible job right now. But an awful lot of the book is about the Jedi and what the Jedi are doing, and so what they do in the beginning of the book is sneak their way back onto Coruscant and strategically take out various highly ranked members of the Lost Tribe of the Sith. But there's a problem here. We have a limited number of Jedi, and we apparently have 5,000 Sith on Coruscant. So thus, the rest of the novel is this endless assault on the Jedi Temple. Admiral Boatu is working with the Jedi, so he provides the military brawn, and the Jedi provide the Jedi might. I guess. But Abeloth is prepared for them, and so while they do manage to take out a lot of Sith, it's still definitely disastrous for the Space Marines and Jedi and any civilians in the area. This was one bit, though, where I feel like the Jedi Order has suffered losses, but we don't really see it play out, because the only named person that we see die before our eyes in a sad scene protecting Alana is Barve, Basil Warve. The Solos and Alana and Barve are ambushed by Sith because uh, Vestara gave them vital information. We'll talk about that in a bit. Barb fights to the bitter end. There are multiple parts where you're like, oh, he cannot get back up again, and he does. He keeps going. And I never really cared for any of these new Jedi characters when they were going mad, but I feel like Barb's willingness to fight to protect Alana, to protect a child that he's been kind to in the past was moving. Like, he's absolutely eviscerated by the Sith, but he helped his friends escape. And can you really want anything else when you're a Jedi? Like, what a way to go out. What a hero. But other than Barb, that's really it on the moving death front. We'll see, like, bodies of Jedi lie here, and we're down this many Jedi. But without names, it doesn't affect you emotionally in the same way that Barb's death scene does. In fact, the assault on the temple sort of felt like 
the Jedi make their way to one place. They're ambushed by the Sith. And then Gisela and Valen and Ben make their way to the computer core, and they are ambushed by the Sith slash Abeloth. And Abeloth captures Ben, and then a fair bit of the book is like, where's Ben? He can't be dead. We would have sensed it. What's going on? And you're like, what's Abeloth gonna do with him? And uh, we'll get to that. And then it's Luke and Jaina and Corrin trying to wake their way to the computer core. They're ambushed by Sith again, and they fight Abeloth in the body of a Sith, but she runs off wounded because, as we learn later, that's when Tahiri killed Pagorski Abeloth. And meanwhile, the Solos and the Millennium Falcon and Alana are landing at the Jedi Temple because Alana has a, a vision that the Sith are going to kill the little Barabelle hatchlings that are hiding in the temple. And she made a promise, and that can't happen. And, you know, and they're attacked by Sith, so then they're running into the temple. And then Jag, who's now left the Imperial Remnant, he picks up the Solos and Alana. And Luke and Jaina are now chasing after Avaloth. And then Saba and Tahiri make their way and finally, you know, take out the computer core. It's just very lengthy and very involved and a bit draining to read. And I wonder if part of that is because the beginning of the book is structured with the Jedi successfully taking out Sith, successfully taking out Sith, successfully taking out Sith. There's a few bits where they let the Sith get away, but they seem to be doing very good. And so to have that just be followed with like this slog of like the Jedi on the back foot the whole time, you're left in suspenseful for, you know, what's going to happen? Are they going to able to achieve it? But it almost drags on too long, I felt. So that when they finally take out the computer core, I'm like, well, finally, my gosh, it took you long enough. All the way back in that first ambush by the Sith, Vistara sees they're there and doesn't really know what to say. And then she's end up captured by the Sith and then she's running away from the Sith. And then she's like, I don't want to be killed by the Sith. So she tells them that Amelia Solo is Alana, the heir to the Hapen throne. And this felt like such a betrayal on Vestara's part. She was never told this. She figured this out. And the whole time she's going along with the Jedi assault, it's because she thinks that if the Jedi eliminate all the High Lords, that then Vestara will be safe. That Vestara doesn't see a future with the Jedi, but the Jedi are achieving her ends. And to see her just go back to the Sith so easily and give them information. It's probably realistic for where she's at in her journey that she's so ingrained in the Sith culture that when she was like, I want to be a Jedi now in book number eight, I was like, I think you're moving too fast. And I was right because, oh man, she reverts back to her former self very quickly here. The one good thing about Bastara is that she recognizes Abeloth is evil and Abeloth needs to be destroyed. But, oh, what she does is so frustrating to read because every book it feels like you see how smart Vestar is, how eager she is to learn, how she could be so much better than she is. She loves Ben, but she's willing to kill other Jedi for Ben. And she likes the Skywalkers, but she's willing to give Olana's secret identity away to save her own skin. Is just so disheartening to read because you really want Vestara to change, but it's almost like there's too much she has to overcome to do so. As all this was going on, this temple assault, the Jedi Order sent Raynar Thol and Tekli and Lobaka to this ancient Killick hive to try to learn more about Abeloth's past and how she could be defeated. And this was another thing that absolutely broke my heart because in The Fate of the Jedi, Raynar has been a very minor character, but you've seen how he's deeply damaged by what happened in the Darkness trilogy and what happened prior to the Darkness trilogy, but he's finally clawed his way back to being an individual, to being Raynar Thol again and not part of this hive mind. And in going to this Killick hive and getting information from them about Abeloth's path, he gets sucked back into that 
hive mind again where he has no individuality, where he is not a separate person. And Tekli and Lobaka leave him there to deliver this information to the Jedi on Coruscant. I mean, Raynar tells them to, but seeing how much Raynar is giving up by staying behind absolutely broke my heart. But what was so important that they had to race back to Coruscant? Well, as I said in the intro, it was that linking Abeloth to the ones on Mortis. That out of the Force came the father, the daughter, and the son, and I guess came to Abeloth's planet originally. But, you know, there was discord between them. The father couldn't keep the peace between the two, so they brought in a mortal servant, which is Abeloth, and she ends up fulfilling a motherly role, keeping the peace between the son and the daughter, and helping the father, but unlike the ones, she's not immortal, she ages, and so she drank from the font of power and swam in the pool of knowledge, and she turned in to the eldritch monster that she is. And I guess regularly in times of chaos, after unending years of war, she'll break out and create havoc, and then the son and the daughter would imprison her again, and imprison her again. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> after encountering Anakin Skywalker, the father, the son, and the daughter are all dead. Previously, they had, the son and the daughter had worked with the Killix to imprison her on her world and, you know, put the black holes in the maw in place and, and center point station and all that. And then after the events of the Galactic Civil War and the Legacy of the Force, center point station blew up and she's loose again. But in capturing Vestar and Ben, Abeloth wants to create that family again. This can't end well. So Ben and Vistar are fighting on Abeloth's world, and Abeloth is trying to get them to, like, bathe in the pool and stuff, and they were like, we won't do it! Although Vestar is very tempted by it. And Jaina is facing off against Ship, while Luke uses his learning from the Mind Walkers to leave his body behind and spiritually travel to Abeloth's planet, and he and an unnamed Sith with like a facial tattoo, they face off against Abeloth. And so while they're fighting Abeloth in spirit form, Ben and Vestara are fighting each other in Abeloth, and Saba and Tahiri are getting closer to Abeloth in the computer core. And so I guess how it all plays out is that Luke and the unnamed Sith are able to spiritually wound Abeloth, which then lets Saba destroy the computer core version of Abeloth, which then means that Ben and Vestara can kill this final body of Abeloth. And Ben still has not given up on Vestara, but Vestara very much gives up on him. With Ship now released from Abeloth's influence, she runs off on Ship. She's like, I can't go back to my people. And Ship is like, there are other Sith in the galaxy. And Luke is very, very wounded, and so Jaina takes them back to Coruscant, and then on Coruscant, Luke's like, well, we've destroyed Abeloth for now, but she will return. She always returns. So he dispatches ten Jedi Knights to try to find the Mortis Obelisk, because they need to retrieve that dagger from Mortis, because that can d destroy these immortal force beads, and then they can have it in reserve as a MacGuffin for whenever Abeloth comes back. And I guess that's my first issue with Apocalypse, is just that it concludes things, but it's more of a conclusion for now. If you're running the spectrum from, like, nothing is tied up to, like, almost everything is tied up, the unifying force, you put the book down with a smile on your face and you're like, what an ending. Yeah, this, this does not go all the way to that level. This definitely leaves a lot of things dangling for future books to pick up on, which then is a pity that the only future books we got were X-Wing, Mercy, Kill, and Crucible. Abeloth is defeated for now, but we've already seen one instance of her coming back where this, like, mysterious tentacle attacks a Jedi Knight and then disappears. This was obviously not meant to be the end of Abeloth, but, like, a lull in the Abeloth fight. Vestara is not going to be a Jedi Knight now. Vestara is on the run with ship. 
And so who knows what's going to come of her next, but does not seem ready to embrace the light side, and I'm not sure if she ever will be ready to do so. Luke dispatches Jedi Knights to bring back Raynar, but we never see him, <laughs> which after Raynar's sad, sad making Techly and Lobaka leave him behind, uh, I sort of wanted to see him again to make sure he's okay. Jaina is promoted to Jedi Master, and she and Jag marry at the end, finally get married, but this was obviously supposed to be a stepping stone to what happened to her next in that Sword of the Jedi trilogy. And after the Sith find out about Alana's identity, they're like, well, I guess we can't keep it a secret anymore, and she's openly, people now know, it's announced that Tenel Ka's heir didn't die, she's still alive, and presumably she will be that Jedi queen that Luke saw in future visions. And not even to mention, like, there's still Lost Tribe of the Sith running around there. If there were 5,000 Sith, they didn't kill 5,000 of them in this book. So are they gonna track the rest of them down? Like, what's gonna go on there? I might not have felt so frustrated with this unconclusive ending if we had gotten the sequels that they planned on, but that didn't pan out. So a lot of these things are left open-ended and are never resolved. My second issue with Apocalypse, probably put, should have put this up first because it's a minor one, but I just, the unconclusive conclusion I had to get that out of me, is that in a continuation of little continuity flubs, there's definitely some of them here. At one point, when Dorvin says that Rokari Kem is from Banesh, and she's definitely not, there are multiple scenes where Tenel Ka is described as though she has both arms, but she doesn't. She's only got one. <laughs> she has not grown an arm back, I promise. And then just a few spelling errors of languages and names from time to time, but not as bad as in previous books. So my third issue with Apocalypse is that backstory for Abeloth. Here's the thing. The Mortis episodes were never my favorite episodes of the Clone Wars. I think because they're just a little too out there for me. The whole idea of like there's this planet of these immortal force users and the father's dying and so Anakin and Obi-Wan and Ahsoka are called there because the father wants Anakin to take his place and that's how he will bring balance to the force but then Anakin sees visions of the future and he's like no and then the father wipes his memories of these visions of the future and then they all end up dead in the end. I think the Mortis episodes work as myth as parable as showing Anakin's division within himself played out in this like epic mythological way but I'm not sure I buy it as fact. And then to incorporate Abeloth into the Mortis mythology I'm not sure I feel about that either especially because I feel like the way it was done was somewhat clunky here. We have Raynar and Lobaka and Tekli find out the story from the Killick Hive, but then Tekli and Lobaka come back and tell the story to Luke, and Luke's like, oh yeah, Yoda told me about Mortis, but I always thought it was just a story. And I'm like, really? We're meant to think that Luke knew about Mortis all along, but he just never told anyone? I mean, the answer, of course, being that until 2011, no one knew about Mortis, but anyway. And then Abelos' inclusion of it is like, they're all like, what? Well, do you see what's missing? A mother is missing. Abeloth was the mother. And I'm like, why does there need to be a mother? I mean, obviously, the daughter is the light side, and the son is the dark side, and the father is the balance between the two. And like, so she's the mother, but she's the chaos, corrupt, fallen mother. I don't know. I liked her better as this more mysterious dark side entity that periodically breaks out. And I think linking her with the Mortis story, while well, I could see why they did so for continuity reasons, I don't think it improves Abelos' story any. And then it sets up them searching for this MacGuffin, them searching for the dagger of Mortis. Like, this is going to be the be-all, end-all, save-all of the Star Wars galaxy. Like, we just got to get this mythical dagger and then we can kill her for good. So maybe it's a good thing we didn't get books <laughs> and series after Fate of the Jedi because having the 
dagger from Mortis be a real thing that you can achieve it just feels like a cheat code. And not really something I want the Jedi to have going forward because dangerous precedent, man. Dangerous precedent. That's just what I'm saying. So, in short, Apocalypse starts off with a very eventful, suspenseful opening in which the Jedi are eliminating key Sith members left and right. But I did find the endless assault on the Jedi Temple a bit of a slog. It's a lot. It's a lot of the book. I think your mileage may vary on the Abeloth origin revelations here, but I was not thrilled about them. And I wish that Fate of the Jedi, at least this final book, had been a little bit more conclusive, but I can understand why it wasn't, because at this point they thought there was going to be more series, they thought there was going to be more books. This was an ending for now, but never meant to be a definitive ending at all. So I'm glad that I finally read the Fate of the Jedi series, because I came into it with for the most part, unspoiled eyes. I liked a lot of aspects of it. I liked the visiting old worlds and old force traditions, even if other aspects of it did not work as well for me. So after 13 years, we got a 10th X-Wing novel. So next time I will be reading a short story that is set prior to X-Wing Mercy Kill, Roll of the Dice, by Karen Miller.